Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode. This week on Plenary Session, I'm joined by Stephen Bradley. He is a researcher in the United Kingdom, a PhD student, and a practicing GP. And he's here to talk about the role of peer review when it comes to commentaries and other thought pieces. You won't want to miss this discussion about publishing. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. I'm back in Plenary Session and I'm joined by Stephen Bradley. Dr. Bradley is a GP and a PhD student in Leeds in the United Kingdom. He's from Northern Ireland and he is a, a admitted Plenard. He's come out and he said he, he enjoys this show. And he sent me a, a really thought-provoking email about the role of peer review in reviewing and assessing commentary that seeks to offer alternative, complementary, dissident, uh, controversial, or uh, devil's advocate positions. Uh, Dr. Bradley, it's a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Thanks so much, Vinay. It's really, really lovely to be here with you. Dr. Bradley, tell us a little bit about what you do first, I guess. You're a GP, you're a researcher. What are you working on these days? So I'm a GP in Leeds. Uh, I work in a, a specialist service for patients who are at risk of being marginalized and are vulnerable, so homeless patients, uh, asylum seekers, and immigrants. And I'm also doing a PhD on lung cancer diagnosis in symptomatic patients. And so does your PhD include r research on screening, cancer screening? It doesn't, no. Um, it's, so our context in the UK is quite different in that we we tended to focus a lot on, on the diagnosis or the earlier diagnosis of symptomatic ah, patients. Yes. Okay. So uh, I've taken a bit of interest in, in lung cancer screening, but it's peripherally related to what I'm, what I'm actually doing. Well, the research I'm, I'm doing is largely about the performance of chest x-ray in the diagnosis of lung cancer. I see. Um, still, among people still, who present with symptoms. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Which, because, because that's yeah. still the default, uh, the default first thing people do when they work it up. Yeah, uh, and very much so here in in the UK as well. It's yeah. uh, it's very much relied upon still. Uh, whereas I think yourselves would would be using CT a lot more. Yeah, well, we uh, as we say in the US, our new physical exam is a PET CT. So we go <laughs> we go straight to where the money is. We just get a PET CT. Uh, don't waste your time. We don't waste our time. <laughs> we don't waste our time with uh, with AP AP lateral films. No way. No siree. P A A P lateral. No no no. PET CT. So. Um, let's talk about this issue that you've brought to my attention. Um, why don't you, why don't I let you introduce it? I mean, what, what you're really asking is, I mean, there's different spaces peer review operates. So let's agree for original research articles. There's certain standards of peer review. Um, I always say that, um, you know, peer review is like pulling a slot machine. You're looking for three cherries. You need three generally favorable, or at least the third one can't hate you too much. Um, and that's really what you're doing. And you play the game and you go to journal, journal, journal. And really maybe it's, it, you pull the slot machine and there's four things that roll. The four, first thing is, of course, the editor has to have some vague interest in it, or at least have some recollection of what the hell you're talking about. And the next thing is the peer reviewers have to kind of agree. Um, that's true for original research. And um, I think it is a useful uh, first step for original research articles. I mean, it keeps out total rubbish. Um, it's also not uh, foolproof. We've seen many prominent journals publish total garbage that was peer reviewed because, you know, you keep submitting it until you get it in. Why does the rabbit run faster than the fox? He runs for his life, not a meal. And that's what happens. Why does bad articles get published? Because the person submitting it just keeps submitting it. Um, but what you're talking about is a different space, peer review for commentary articles. Um, and, 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 your, and, and the thrust of your email to me was you feel like people don't really understand what the purpose of it is. They view it as a way to say, would I have written this article? And that's really not what it is. So I wonder if you might talk us through your thinking about this. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think, I think we've got a wee bit mixed up in what these articles are for. And I think 
part of this is maybe the way that we've fallen in love with the peer review process, which has a function and is useful clearly, but it's not necessarily the tool that is required for every process in scientific discourse. Mm. So, I mean, I think one of the things that I find hard when I write an opinion piece is I feel that the reviewer has not really grasped what I think the task for them is, which is not to decide whether I would have written this piece or whether I agree with this piece, mm -hmm. but to discern whether there is a legitimate argument being made here that is coherent and, you know, is, is defend, is defensible. And I think that's largely, in a way, I, I think that's, it's not that surprising that, uh, ourselves as clinical academics aren't that good at it because I think it's an editorial task, really. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of us aren't that sophisticated, really. We're technicians, some of us. And I think it's maybe, it's maybe a bit of a big ask for some people to be able to, you know, not only read and assess the piece, but to take a step back and to work out if this is a, a legitimate uh, opinion to hold. And I think that's where this stuff falls down so often. And that seems like a shame because it means that we're not really exposed to um, difficult opinions as much as perhaps we should be. That's, you know, a, a really, I think it, it, it's a really deep observation that you've come to. Um, and I think I, I, I want to keep probing at this for the, for the remainder of our time, because I think people don't really get, um, get what it's about. Um, so, you know, there's so many issues in medicine, biomedicine, that there is no canonical right answer. There are a few that there is a canonical right answer, and let's not take that away. Um, you know, the MMR vaccine, good thing. Uh, uh, antibiotics for, for, for pneumonia, uh, a good idea. Uh, you know, opening up a clogged artery in an ST elevation MI, good. So there are things that we all agree, okay, good. Um, but there's a huge number of topics where there is a legitimate debate. And the debate can both be about, you know, should we do something or not do it? Or if something new is coming, what should the standard for adoption be? Um, the debate can be about, does this really work through the mechanism we think it works? Or does it work through an alternative mechanism? And, and, and without a doubt, individual doctors and researchers may have fallen somewhere on the spectrum of the debates in their field. They may feel like, um, you know, this new blood-based screening test for cancer, it doesn't need a randomized trial to be approved. If it finds cancer, that's sufficient. Other doctor might feel, as I feel, that you really need to do the randomized study up front to show a benefit and, and why do I feel the way I feel because we have been burned before in the past and I would give some examples of that but we both have our own argument and the challenge with peer review is it's easy to see that someone has handed you the power the veto power over an article they've asked you to invite to comment on it and you can easily screw them over by writing I think a very negative review and and you may forget that your job is not to ask, does this reflect my views on the issue, but rather, is this a defensible position that, you know, some people in this field may hold, and ergo, we ought to let it out there so that the, 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 the battle of ideas is allowed to compete in the open. Um, is, that a, is that a fair characterization of your position that we're not, it's not about, you know, it's about allowing a range of views? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's actually really difficult for people to be able to do that. And we pick these peer reviewers who are generally represent the mainstream opinion and those people will have a vested interest they've got skin in the game they will generally believe in the practice of a thing as is currently done of course so so will not necessarily agree with you in the first place and often i find um well not often i'm not had that that much experience in this but sometimes i'll i'll find that people will uh will respond to comments that were not made in the article you know it's almost like you've just triggered a defense mechanism and that person will just go, you know, bypass all thinking and go straight to the arguments they had with somebody a while ago that have nothing to do with what you said. Oh my yourself. God. So you end up, you end up making these responses to something that you didn't say or necessarily agree with anyway. So, I mean, sometimes so common, so common. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I really started thinking about this and emailed you after your conversation with John Mandrola and he yeah. mentioned that obviously context expertise is important and i think i think it, it, that is the case you know that is true but a lot of these things i think don't necessarily need to be delegated to peer review at all i think the question is is this interesting is it a legitimate point M might people be interested 
And there's not there's not that much more than that, really. That's, that's exactly what I say. I say editors just need to have some courage and say, this needs to be seen. And if people don't like it, they can reply. But I think, you know, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. One thing I've noticed a lot, um, and I guess I would say that I've published on a, a range of controversial topics. I'll just enumerate a couple of them. Cancer screening, of course, I have my strong viewpoint, which comes across on this show to the guests. What should the standards be for drug approval of cancer drugs? Um, and genomics, who should get a genomic testing and when? And what should the standards be for adopting genomic tests? And I would say of all those domains, the one that gives me the most grief is the genomics. I mean, there's just more people because there's both, I think, a, a, a pecuniary interest in it as well as a an academic interest and philanthropic interest. So it gets like a lot of a diverse coalition of people who don't like my view that we ought to hold routine applications of genomic tests to randomized control trials that are powered for hard endpoints um, because both the people who are fundraising for it don't want that standard and the people who are, who are selling the service don't want that standard either um, to some degree because it will make it harder to sell the service and 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 and, and then also to some degree because they're true believers they just think it's going to work no matter what and the randomized trials going to be positive why do it um, I would disagree with you know with that assertion um, that one gives me the most. The cancer screening, I think, uh, as you say, I mean, one of the things I've noted is we have an editorial about lung cancer screening and we take a critical look at it. Um, but almost every reviewer we get, my guess is, they, many of them are running their hospital's lung cancer screening program. They've been tasked with making this happen, make that happen. And so, of course, they're not going to be very interested in hearing somebody articulate reasons why the very purpose they've been granted in life um, is, is not worth doing potentially i mean i guess i want to say i mean obviously i believe what i mean i don't know i'm in a difficult position here i want to also say like obviously i'm writing the article because i believe it um and that's why i'm writing the article i've come to that belief after reading the evidence that's what i've reached but i also understand that not everyone will and the goal of my article is to get somebody in the middle to flip their vote to my side and get somebody on the far extreme to maybe temporize their comments um and i and i think we do a, a bad job of that and then the next thing you said um People impute things in your text that you did not say. Oh boy, it happens. It's omnipresent. Um, I think to some degree, they impute things in your argument that they heard somebody else say on Twitter, social media, on different platforms. Um, I've even gotten a lot of ad hominem, like Dr. Prasad uh, you know, doesn't like X, Y, or Z, and he's previously said that, even if it's not germane to the particular topic. Um, and I think editors just, I mean, they're, I'll, I'll put it this way. There are few editors who are really good and they have been doing it a long time, many of them. Some of them are new, but they're good. Um, but they know what it means to be an editor, which means to some degree you have to take ownership. But there are a lot of editors, like a lot of people in society these days, that the, they don't want the buck to stop with them. And if you want to overrule a peer reviewer, if you want to contradict them, you are putting yourself at risk, and they don't want to do that. The safest thing to do, which is something that people in academics are very good at, safe choices, is to only approve articles that get three good peer reviewers um, and three perfect peer reviews. And what that means is, I think the next part of what you wrote in your essay, which was we just get an inordinate amount of articles that say the same thing. Um, you know, you say, uh, quote, um, meanwhile, people are, quote, invited to spin out the same hackneyed views ad infinitum. Um, that's, how, that's what you wrote in your email to me. And I think that's absolutely true because those are the views that consistently clear the peer review. And I guess the last thing I'll say before I toss it back to you was I just recently read somebody who I used to hold in very high regard, but over the course of the pandemic, my impression of this person has diminished. But this person was, you know, made a claim that, um, you know, you should trust somebody who's published a lot of peer-reviewed articles on COVID. And I said, well, you know, that's just so unfair for everybody who has a non-canonical view about COVID because um, it, you can publish non-canonical views. They just take time. We haven't had a lot of time. So, um, and, and, I, and I likened it to the example of this playground bully that's sitting on the kid's chest asking them why they won't stand up. That's exactly what you're doing. The reason they're not publishing peer review articles is because you're the one sitting on their chest and you're asking them why they can't stand up. Um, and, and so I think you're right in the, in, in, on all these dimensions. Any, for anything that that makes you think of? Yeah, yeah, a lot of points there. I like that simile about the, uh, the the sitting on the chest. Um, so, in terms of in terms of the the vested interest stuff, you know, this should be obvious. You write something about a thing, and then you give it to peer reviewers who are in that business, and then they don't like what you said. You know, that's it's not that hard to get your head around that 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 might that that might happen. Mm -hmm. So, I think I think maybe editors could be a wee bit better at spotting that and giving a little bit more thought to that in terms of the stuff around people not you know people responding to what you didn't say I, I find that hard actually because if I can't get a peer reviewer to read what I wrote you know 
like I, I just think you know i think not not many people read this stuff anyway but if i can't get the person who meant to be reading it in the first place to read it then that's a real struggle and to some extent that has to be one's own responsibility as a person writing this stuff but i think when you've had these debates that have gone on for a while people just bypass the eyes and the brain and just go you know to the go to the arguments the rise that they've already had and it's really really hard you know to you're, overcome you're, that you're saying something that is really resonating with me which is um, you know, when I came up in school, and I'm not even talking about college or postgraduate school, I'm talking about, you know, grade school. When I was in grade school, you know, we took classes in English light writing and literature and, and, and reading and, and, you know, just basic argumentative, I'm not argumentative, classes just about what did a book say. And we were taught that, you know, if you want to say something about a book that this author is making this point, you have to quote the book point out that they're saying it, build the case that they are in fact making that claim, and then say why you agree or disagree with the claim and what other evidence there might be. And, you know, I got that in, in my undergraduate training. I got that in, I, I think, seventh grade. I feel like I got that, you know, reading like children's books. Um, and, and the teacher were good about like, you know, well, did they really say that? Um, where we are right now in 2020, it really scares me. I feel like I see routinely people say things about articles that um, it just doesn't, it doesn't say that in the article. And we live in, tw in a world of Twitter where somebody can tweet and say, this article says, and then they have a claim that's actually not in the article. And everyone will amplify that claim without anybody verifying if it's in the article. And in fact, I think that's bad. You know, I try to read the articles before I retweet them. That's why I'm always a little bit slow to do some of these things. Um, but, um, and then there are even a group of people that I think takes it a step further. And they say that um, you're under no obligation to read material that you consider inflammatory or incorrect. You can merely take someone else's word that it is inflammatory and incorrect and call for the condemnation of the material and the person who wrote the material. That to me is so anti, I don't even know, anti, uh, I don't even want to say anti-liberalism. It's not even liberalism. It's just anti-rational. It's just crazy. Um, and yet I think I see this all, all the time on the, on the internet, all the time among educated people. Yeah, it is, a, it is a anti intellectual streak, certainly, and amongst all this. And a lot of it is about sentiment and whether you're the right sort of person. You know, are you one of us or one of them? And the way there's certainly been a lot of polarization that's happened in the last, you know, five years, but certainly in the last, last year, it's accelerated yeah. a lot. And I think probably for all of us, it's quite hard to actually read a text and, and, um, try to take a, an even-handed look at what it's actually saying. But to go back to the stuff about peer review itself, yeah. and I think you made some really interesting points there. And the, the way I see this being used is it's almost like this sort of machine. You know, you send in this stuff to the journal and somebody turns on the peer review machine. Yeah. It's like, right, it goes to the two, it goes to the two or three reviewers and then it comes back, you know, and we do what that says. And there's no, there's no comeback or appeal in this process. And if you say, you know, actually there is stuff in that that was factually incorrect, it doesn't matter. Decision has been made. It you doesn't know, matter. It's, complete, it's completely unaccountable. And it's, you know, and I suppose it's, it's understandable, uh, in a way because it's in some ways it's a sort of quality control mechanism. But actually I think there's, there's, elements of judgment here that ought to be exercised by some journals and some journals do do this you know wonderfully uh of course um but there's a, there's a lot of variation and yeah. sometimes sometimes you see editorial decisions that seem slightly um, well so sometimes sometimes you'll get good reviews and then the editor says yeah good reviews but we're not going with it well oh, yes. why, why did so you, why send, did you it send it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's easy to slag the stuff off. And I suppose we ought to be, uh, we ought to bear in mind that uh, to some extent we're, you know, disgruntled article writers uh, ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I think that. <laughs> and I've, uh, you know, I've certainly thought that I'd be a bit intimidated by the challenge of being a journal editor. And I'd, I'd find that, I'd find it very, very difficult. But reviewing this stuff and reviewing it well is not easy. And actually, I think, I think another, problem is the stuff for reviewing opinion pieces or commentaries is kind of seen as uh, i'll do that in the 20 minutes before we go to bed you know yeah, it's not like right. it's you know people don't think about it as seriously yeah and I th you know i think 
you don't necessarily need to spend as long on an opinion piece as you would in any other piece. But I think if if somebody has, written, has spent the, the time to write up an article and given it some thought, I think they're entitled to a bit of careful consideration or or to at least read read the article before you trash it. I can accurately summarize it. I mean, I always think that I don't, I mean, the, the, I think there's just a few of us left before we all die. Um, and I hope there'll always be a few of us left um, who, you know, I judge someone's criticism of an article based on how well they summarize the themes of the article. And it stinks to me when people disingenuously summarize the article. You know, that's just not quite what they said. And you're saying that because it makes it easier to refute. You're not actually taking them on face value. And then the other thing that bothers me is when they refute the article, but they don't argue why the opposite worldview would be correct. Like, why would you believe the alternative worldview? But to, to the point you're making, I think if people want to get a sense of the power of the peer review process... Go to the BMJ website where you can read the replies to the peer reviewers. You will me- it's like a dog that's been electrocuted. I mean, it is a groveling an- it's a groveling animal. It's a de- it's a defeated an- I mean, the things people write, you can just read them. Uh, um, we we beg and plead and thank and and honor and and perform a ritual uh, sacrifice to the peer reviewers and thank you so much and we've accepted everything you say. you know it's over the top um, just excessive flattery um, and they have to do that because the power dynamic is is so skewed that if they don't do that they're at risk of not you know catching this fish and if they do do that they might have a shot at it um, it's a it's a problematic arrangement. Um, and, and I think, I don't know, I don't know what the best model is, but I think we're shifting to a model. I think eLife has announced they're going to post articles and just let people comment and are and argue in the footnotes and, and let that be the guide. And I think that's a better, I mean, that, I think there's advantages to that as well. One of the challenges there is there's going to be a handful of articles that just get disproportionate attention drawn to them, and they may get disproportionate criticism or even disproportionate praise, and there's going to be a lot of articles that just get fly under the radar. But anyway, I want to come to the last part of what you were said, which I think is the most interesting part. Um... Here's what you ask. Uh, I wondered if it might be helpful for you to discuss on the podcast what strategies you have for getting challenging viewpoint articles accepted through peer review. Do you nominate peer reviewers? Do you pitch directly to editors? Um, do you bring on a co-author who might have additional credibility to overcome the skepticism? Is there even a point in writing these papers? Should we just blog instead? Um, what are your thoughts? Um, and I'm curious to get your thoughts, but I'll tell you some of my thoughts. Um, so wh- as this thread in my life was emerging, which is my greater understanding and appreciation of what peer review is and isn't, um, the other thread that emerged in my life was um, just thinking about the revenue of these publishers. Um, they're making oodles of cash. Many of these publishers, like the Nature Publishing Group and Elsevier Saunders, um, oodles. I mean, we're talking about 40% profit on revenue, billions of dollars a year. Um, and 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 aside from the top premier journals, like maybe four, five, six journals where the editors actually do edit the manuscript and the typesetters and copy editors do, do work, um, the rest of the journals, they do almost nothing. I mean, if you get the pull the lot slot machine and get the three cherries, they just post your article one day with like nothing. No, you know, nothing is, uh, you know, done other than what you've done to sate the reviewers. Um, so it's a very lopsided system. Um, and I guess the other thing I felt was um, some of these opinion articles that I thought were really powerful were just uh, not getting anyone reading them. <laughs> That's just a fact. Um, I started to make the podcast and and Twitter, and I found that there were many people interested in some of these opinions. So that was that was the other thing. And then I started to think about, you know, it, to some degree, I'm just giving my copyright, my intellectual product to these to these publishers for nothing. They they don't really edit. They just give me a hard time. So I guess the answer to your question is I've kind of shifted. I mean, I, I, all of the original articles we do, be it a research letter or an opinion or a full original article, um, I will we will all, we'll just always publish those in journals. Um and I think we do something like 20 a year. I guess by we, I mean me and the few people who work in my research green team. Um, and then the opinion articles, I will say that I've been like the dog who's been, you know, electrocuted a few times. I know to not go outside the yard. So actually, I mean, I would say that I, I've been dissuaded from writing, writing a lot of articles. Like I have an idea and I think, oh, it would be a beautiful thousand word essay. Um, but, uh, no one will take it. So I won't even write it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm that condition. Like I won't even, I won't even pursue it. You know, for instance, grail grail. I mean, I could write an article about grail pointing out why this is the blood-based cancer screening test that they're, they're running. Mm. And I think the, the NHS just agreed to do like 50,000 uncontrolled study or something ri- ridiculously wasteful and won't answer any question. And I thought about like, you know, it'd be a great jam of viewpoint to say the, the holy grail, what has it delivered and what, and, and why is it might be just like the real holy grail, potentially a mythology. Um, and, and, um, but I, but I don't even do it. 
I mean, like, I'm just like been shocked so many times. I know it probably won't be published in JAMA and then it won't be published in New England and it won't be published in the annals. And then it will be published in, you know, some seventh string journal and nobody will read it uh, aside from the tweet I tweet. Um, meanwhile, I've been writing like more, um, commentaries for Medscape, MedPage. Um, they don't pay a lot of money, but they do actually pay a little bit of money for a commentary. And, 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 and I write books, which again, don't pay, you know, it's like a dollar an hour. I joke, but it's not a joke. It's actually a lot, really close to true. Um, but, um, but at least there's that, like a book lives for a longer time. And so I've taken a lot of that energy and channeled it into these other pursuits. And I don't think that's good. I mean, I think that reflects like, that's why your letter struck me so hard, which was that, I mean, what it really says is that, um, you know, here's a scientist saying that um, I have been electrocuted so many times that I don't want to play the game anymore. And um, and I don't think that's good for science. I mean, I think it's it's really bad. I think this year has been the worst year on record in terms of the inability to listen to even one sliver of a different opinion than what you have. Um, but I'm not sure we have a good system for this. Um, anyway, I'm curious how you're early in your career. I think there's a difference that comes to the other thing I'd say is like when you're early in your career, to some degree, at least a handful of people need to know who you are. I mean, it doesn't have to be a large handful, but, um, so to do that, I think one has an, a, feels a compulsion to try to publish in these journals to build some sort of rep credibility as a, as a researcher. Um, but once you get a little further in your career, I think you face the question of, you know, am I spending my life like I really want to spend my life? Do I want to write articles that nobody reads? Um, and and uh, and and it's difficult to publish. And so I think that's when people make the shift. So anyway, I'm curious what you think. The answers to your own questions. Well, thanks. That's that's a really those are really interesting insights. And uh, yeah, I think you've confirmed much of what I much of what I thought before. Can I just ask you though? Do you nominate peer reviewers? Does oh, that good help? question. Never. I mean, I guess I'd say when they force me to, I do. But on my own. I would say never. Um, and I guess I have mixed feelings about that too, because I think, I don't know. I don't know if I, this is the right word. When I, when I see some other papers that I think get published with many methodologic flaws and one digs a little bit deeper, one often finds they are reviewed by friends of that author or people the author likes. And that to me is not right either. So I have not done, and honestly, I don't think I have that many friends who would do it. You know? <laughs> I mean, I just don't, I just don't think like, I also, I don't want to burden people. So you I said one to me, if any, I'll put it through. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I don't do that that much. Um, and I, um, I don't know. I would be worried. Do I, and the other question you asked was, do I pitch directly to the editors? I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess sometimes I'm occasionally asked to, um, you know, write it. Like I'm invited to write it. And these days, to be honest, probably the majority, I mean, because I've, I've, I mean, you can just, I mean, I haven't tracked it myself, but I believe my behavior has really shifted. Like I used to write a lot of these kind of opinion articles. I really enjoyed writing them. I thought they were really fun. And when I was a, when I was a, when I was a trainee, a medical resident, which I guess is your registrar, um, I loved reading a really good, well-written commentary. I remember when I read Alan Brett's, um, Oh, what was it? Should everybody perioperatively get cardiovascular screening and all the perioperative things we did? That was like a, it was like a Jack paper, a pro con debate that was published, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 10 years ago. And I remember being a resident and I was thinking about the topic and I Googled and I found it and I printed it and I put it in my coat pocket. And then like one day, I don't know, in the cafeteria, I read it over, over a meal and I just thought it was splendid. It was like one of the best things I've ever read. Um, and, it, and that wasn't the only one, you know, there's so many great commentaries that I've read. In fact, as a resident, I treasure those even more than the original articles, which I thought were, you know, I mean, they're kind of dryly written. Um, and so, you know, I tried to do one. I, I wrote one in 2012 on the pulmonary embolism, the history of it, and how, you know, what they meant by PE in 1960 and what they meant by PE in 2012 were just different PEs. It's like probably, you know, one-tenth the size of the original PE. Um, and I loved writing that. And, and Richard Lehman said something really nice about it, which made my life, you know, made my day. Um, mm -hmm. it's about a decade ago and I had a lot of, res I mean, I still have a lot, of course, a lot of respect for the great Richard Lehman. Um, and it was great to make his blog, um, you know, as a resident. Um, and so, so I have a lot of affinity for that, but, um, yeah. Um, but it's changed my behavior overnight. I mean, I bet if you looked in the last year versus the first year I published, the ratio is like 80% commentary in the first year to probably 20% commentary in the last year. I think I, it's, I've been shocked. Yeah. 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 
No, it's really interesting. I think part of the sadness of this as well is you write this stuff and, you know, you think it's fair enough, but a bit provocative, whatever. And it just gets slowly attenuated through this yes. torture of peer review. Yes. Like anything, any spark or dynamism is taken out of it. Yes. And you just end up with this sort of tepid puddle, which, you know, doesn't really challenge anybody at all. And then you kind of wonder why, why did I bother? with this in the first That's place. That's so well put. I mean, I will say, um, just for a minute to talk about um, writing op-eds, blogs, um, these sorts of trade press kind of things that I do. Um, I've had different experiences and some of the trade presses heavily edit what I've written um, and they take the teeth out of it. And at the end, it doesn't even, when I read it aloud, it doesn't feel like my own voice in my own head. Like it feels like somebody else's voice, you know? And, and I always hate those pieces and, and they don't, they don't connect with, I mean, I, I believe they don't connect with the audience anecdotally. Um, the ones that keep the voice, um, that I think connects. Um, so I think you're right. It can become tepid and, and washed and watered down to the point. Um, and that's the other problem with peer review. It, it homogenizes, it, it draws everything to the middle, um, which is fine for the field, but individual articles should be allowed some range. I guess, I mean, I think maybe it's just the broader failure where we are as a society that we, we just, we're not capable of listening to ideas that we do not like. We're, I, 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 I see it in politics. I see it in medicine. I've, I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, and this year has been the worst year for it where we have made unprecedented global changes and everybody is sure they're right. I was like, how the fuck are you sure? I find it astonishing because I'm not sure about many of the things we did and and I still have equipoise and I've been trying to fight for um, people's right to have a range of views. Um, um, you know, even on, on this thing. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, but I and, and I've been demonized for that recently. Uh, that you know, how dare this bastard ask that allow us to listen to everyone's view? He's got you know, he's 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 in cahoots with the people with the bad views, and it's all good and bad. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I guess this is all beside the point. But I mean, your point is a really a profound point, and and you've come to it really early. Um, oh, the last thing I'd say um, about this topic is one of the things that I have personally done is on many issues where I have a commentary, I flip it into a research project. And so I think a couple of years ago, I wanted to say something about the patient advocacy groups that take a lot of pharmaceutical money because I find that they don't always say things that I think are consistent with what patients, what's in the best interest of patients. And instead of writing that commentary, which I know would never have cleared peer review, I, we did just an empirical investigation. We went to a website that had a list of 60 patient advocacy groups and we just looked up how much money they take. And, and so that, that's a descriptive paper. And so I think a lot of commentaries in my mind have flipped into descriptive papers. Um, and I think that continues. Like I had an idea about, um, about data sharing. I mean, you know, I'm passionate about data sharing and we have a pay and we flipped it into an empirical analysis, which is what, um, that should come out any day now. But basically we took, um, every, article that the FDA oncology drug products division published in the last, I don't know, five years. And we looked through all the articles that were secondary analysis. They, they were only able to do because they had shared data and we have a table and the table shows what were the analysis the FDA was able to do that a company was not able to do because they had actual, ac actual access to the individual patient level data. And by doing that empirical analysis and just showing people what they've been able to look at, um, I think it's, it's a forceful defense of data sharing. It actually makes the point I want to make, which is that imagine if you allowed five people to look at this data instead of just two people, the company and the FDA, um, you would ex in exponentially increase the number of things we could learn. Um, because I think that they learned a lot of really clever things. So I guess that's the way I overcome it. Because I think original articles that don't make too strong a point, but just show the world as it is, and you really can't argue like this is you know, they publish these 10 articles, this is what it shows. That's how I have channeled the energy of, of commentary and, and um, in, in, in the research space. And sometimes, occasionally, maybe I'm wrong. Like 5% of the time, I'm like, oh shit, like that, I was totally off base. And so it, 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 maybe it's, it's good to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting. I mean, because we were having this conversation, I was thinking to myself, you know, why, why, why do I write these things anyway? Like, what's, what are they for? And I kind of thought the reasons I came up with, I suppose, are it's a slightly conceit, really, in that, you know, you think people ought to know what you're thinking, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but also, 
it's also a good chance, I think, to try and test your ideas with yourself. Yes, I agree. Because you, you write it out. Yes. You think you know something. You think you've got this argument. <clears throat> but you write it out. And actually, by the time you finish the article, you kind of you kind of think slightly differently about yes. it than you did before. And I, I suppose that's what you're saying about leading to actual research projects and doing something worthwhile with the idea. Yes. Um, it's, so a way it's, to, it's a way to hone your own thoughts. I mean, writing is thinking and thinking is writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a kind of it's a kind of discipline. But in terms of what you were saying about your career, that's really interesting. And I think I can kind of see that happening to myself as well. I mean, partly this is because when you're junior, you know, you don't have any power. Yeah. And the only thing you can do is is write up this stuff and hope that people will take yeah. it and print it. Um and yeah, as I've gone on, I suppose I probably would try less through that route. And one thing I've really enjoyed is is you know the the blog format and BMJ blogs, BMJ opinion are yes, excellent, yes. and it's so it's such a satisfying experience. You know, you can. I was saying to you in an email. You know, I had an idea when I was cycling the bike. Basically, write it in your head. Come back. You know, write down some notes. Write it up uh, in a few hours. Send it off. Goes to the editor. Comes back. Editor makes it a lot better than it was. You yes. know, this is the opposite of the peer review process. Yes. Yes. It comes back like a lot stronger and more assertive than it was. And then it's out the following week. It's just such a, it's just such a, you know, cleaner, more satisfying process. Yes, I agree with you so much. I mean, some of the ones that I'm most proud of were from, um, you know, I've been thinking about the idea for a long time. I mean, you know, I, I agree with Hemingway, long periods of thinking, short periods of writing. Um, and that's the secret. So I've been thinking about the ideas for a long time. And then it's as, as always, as you say, on a walk, a bike, some physical exertion where you have some clarity in space, you just see how, oh, okay, I can put this and then this and then this. And then you're like kind of eager to get home. So you can type that up real quick before you forget it. <laughs> and then you type it up. And the ones that... Um, that come quickly are always the ones that I think strike a chord with people because they're very topical and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's satisfying as an author in a way that it's not when it comes a couple years later. But to your point about writing and thinking, I mean, I think, I don't know, one of my things that I've learned having written, I guess, two books, um, which are just different length. I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, like book, you know, 300 page things. Um, it, it it really shapes your thinking. And it's not it's not just like on the court. I mean, just like an essay shapes your thinking over the course of a, a week or two weeks, you know, a book shapes your thinking over the course of half a year or a year, because that's really what it takes, I think, to draft it start to finish. Um, and then to go back and read it and, and look f and think in your own mind, what are the inconsistencies? What am I missing? Um, and so when I get like, when I read somebody who's really critical of a book, um, who's never written a book, I'm like, it's, yeah, it's easy to be critical of a book. Just sit down and try to write one, my friend, because it is not so easy. And, and I, I'm, by, I'm by no means I think my book is perfect. I mean, I know it's not. I mean, because I, I know all the imperfections that went into it. Um, but I think it's a good exercise, too, to try to write something at a very long length. Um, and I guess maybe that's my bias because I was a philosophy major and we had to turn in, like, homework assignments at, like, 50-page essays. But in terms of, like, power in careers... It's interesting because, I mean, I graduated fellowship six years ago, so I'm in my sixth year as faculty member. And on the inside, I guess I will tell you, I mean, I feel pretty powerless in the sense that I have no tenure, no, um, uh, I mean, I live on soft money. If somebody, uh, and it was a miracle of God that uh, a philanthropic foundation funds our work. If that hadn't have happened two years ago, um, it, it would have been, I would, it would all fold it. I mean, I probably would have, I would have been almost exclusively clinical work. I still do a lot of clinical work. Actually, I enjoy it. Um, but I would have, it would have been a lot less research. Um, and certainly nobody to help me do kind of projects. Um, and, and, and yet I think from an external observer being six years out, uh, seems like it's a much more secure place. And I think, I guess most of that has come for me personally, not, although I've written a lot of articles, I don't think. I mean, it was Twitter probably, unfortunately, um, and podcasting that has gotten more of a reach. Um, and actually, of all the things I do, I think podcasting is the most gratifying because I consistently get people who say, I enjoy your podcast. Whereas on Twitter, I mean, it's in inevitable. Um, everyone says, not everyone, but a sizable chunk of people who read your stuff say, you know, you're an asshole. I don't like you. And I'm like, um, oh, and the last thing that you you said that I, want, I kind of wanted to make the point was like, um, I guess I would say... I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I really love people who, I love people who have an opinion. 
And I guess I, I feel like we're in an interesting time where you can demonize somebody for having opinions. But you know what? Opinion, people who are opinionated, who have opinions, whether you like them or not, they're just a joy to have in your life. Like, they're a joy to have at dinner parties. They're a joy to talk to. People who have opinions who aren't, you know, rigid, you know, inflexible, con- you know, just assholes about them. But people who have opinions who are willing to have a dialogue, a laugh, to, you know, say, all right, fine, I went too far there. You know, to, those are the people you want at your dinner table. The people who come and have no opinions, nothing to say. That kills me. But I think, to your point, I mean, we're creating an incentive system and where we're encouraging people to have no opinions. It's not right that somebody thinks, um, you know, um, that we, we we shouldn't, like, closing schools was a bad idea. Like, that's bad. You know, that's a bad opinion. So we can only have one opinion. We can only all think the same. It's it's crazy to me. I, I've never, it's a joyless existence. I, I don't know how anyone could live like that. It's anti-intellectual. It's anti-fun. Um, and it's just uh, unpleasant. <laughs> it's unpleasant to be around people with no opinions. So that's in part why to write is to, to You know, you say it's a conceit that people want to read your opinions. I do want to read your opinions. And I think we are craving, people crave, when you look on Twitter, and 99% of people say the same fucking thing. The same thing. Something happens, and they all say the same fucking thing. I know they're going to say the same thing. They almost say the same thing like a badge, like we're part of the same club. We all have this. I know, it's so so boring and predictable. You know what they're going to say already? You know, like the event, the event is funneled through the prism. Uh, sorry, mixing metaphors there, but you know, it, it's the event is processed by the way the people see things, and you know what they're going to say already. It's it's so so tedious. I totally agree. No, I'm. I mean, I think you're you're. It's it's tedious. It's painful. I see it all the time. And and adding to that is this something about being home all day, cooped up, that makes people crazy. And, and it's not just that they want to say the same thing. It's like, they want to be outraged by the same event. And so I see the same like pattern, outrage, 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 outrage. There's another outrage. Okay, fine. Does anyone have any fucking original <laughs> ideas? And so it's, a, it's like, sometimes it's like, I, re- I see an article and it's like a new way to look at, I don't know, lung cancer screening or um, some additional thoughts on genomics. I'm like, oh yes, yes. And sometimes I read article and I'm like, oh, this is totally wrong. But you know what? I, I also want to say thank you for that person to put yourself out there and keep me entertained entertained for 15 minutes. I don't have to read the same mind numbing, boring shit online. Um, and so I think it's good to write and, um, and people will crave it. And, and I don't know, I, I, but I do agree with you. And I think that if, I mean, hopefully, I guess the takeaway from this podcast is that somebody who's listening is actually an editor or peer reviewer, and maybe they will actually walk away and say, maybe the next time I review one of those articles, I am actually going to say, doesn't matter what I think it's, you know, would somebody out there be interested in this point of view? And is it more or less defensible? Does it not have any sort of chasms in it? Um, and and let, let that be the bar. Um, yeah, that's my that's my two cents. Can I ask you one last question? Yeah. Does this stuff do you any good for your career? You know, these kind of opinion articles and stuff like this, this is very cynical and kind of, uh, you know, it's not a very idealistic question. But is, is, from a selfish point of view in terms of your career, does this do you any good? writing stuff like this um okay good question i guess i would say depends on the goal um i mean if the goal of someone's career is to advance through the academic ladder then i um to become chief and chair and dean then i think in fact um it has uh, no effect or perhaps even a decremental effect and that the the surest path to do that is to um, um to have a social media presence to show your face to only praise articles, to never say anything bad about any one of your colleagues. I mean, let's say I, my goal is to be dean. I'm, I'm a graduating student. Um, congratulations, amazing paper by Dr. So-and-so. Congratulations, amazing paper by Dr. So-and-so. Just that's, that's the whole feed. And then I've had great mentors. Here are my great mentors. I've had great mentees. Here are my great mentees. Here's a picture of me getting a flu shot. Yay, flu shots. Yay. You know, okay. I mean, I think you want to keep it very positive, very professional and not say anything that is ever critical of anybody um, and your professional that's so that's your public persona and then your professional persona I think should be um, original research article original research article the, the blander the topic the better so um, polymorphisms in some you know cell membrane protein that's gold that's gold over do that over and over again no commentaries um, maybe the occasional editorial but if the editorial should just be like your Twitter feed amazing article proves the be- beauty of pembrolizumab as frontline therapy for colon cancer keynote 177 you know cheerlead that 
Um, and then keep your uh, head down, say nothing, um, and and I think you will be. Uh, and, and and as if you're a competent person, you can get pretty far. Uh, so I think I think so. I think that's one sense of good for your career. I think um, the other career that I think of, which maybe is dead, is that there are still going to be some f- professors who are around who have um, thoughtful and diverse opinions on lots of things, and. When I grew up, I enjoyed reading their books. I remember how I thought Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene and Extended Phenotype was mm, splendid. Yes, yeah, wonderful book. Wonderful book. Those first two Dawkins books were so fucking wonderful. People don't even, I mean, and uh, some of the other Dawkins books, okay, I mean, he's got strong issues and I'm not a big fan. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I have no interest in this, litigating this religion science thing to death. Um, but the first two books were just splendid. Um, I think of some other public intellectuals that I think um, have written so many really thoughtful books. And when I grew up, those were the people I always admired. Um, those were the people who, you know, when I was 16, 22, 24, who I felt like, uh, you know, I was getting a tour of their mind. And so if your idea of, of success is to have some position in the in world where you can reach somebody the way Richard Dawkins' book reached me when I was, I think, 19 years old, um, then I think writing these is not just, um, I think it's necessary, even if you, even if it's hard and even if you don't get everything you want, where you want it. And even if you shift from peer review journals to, um, to, um, the lay press, um, I, I don't know if you'll get promoted for it. I mean, I do think there's something to be said for when somebody looks at your CV and there's just a lot of shit on it, they're going to be like, oh, it's better than something with less things on it. Because that's, to be honest, just like just like reading your article. They're not, re- you know, most people obsessing your CV are like, oh my God, 200 things, yay. And um, and I also see people who tweet like, uh, I have published in the New England Journal of Medicine and it's a letter to the editor. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. It's not publishing in the New England Journal. It's 150 word. You just asked him some questions. No, 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 you can't say that um but anyway but people don't fact check those things so i mean i think there might be a slight benefit of publishing but i guess it depends i mean i think you know i had john yonides on this podcast and i asked him like why did he you know put you know why does he continue to keep talking about these things despite all this like criticism he says and then i think he said something that i thought kind of stuck with me where he said that um if i were to silence myself um you know it'd be no life worth living for me like like he mm. just views it as like you know you can agree with him or disagree with him but like he feels some com- obligation to like like I should just say what I think um and 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 that resonates with me I think to some degree which is like if I I don't know if I read an article and I want to say that I could disagree with this article and I start to think like oh is that good for me or bad for me anyway I'm writing actually I'm writing an, art- an article about this which I will share with you after we're done um I'll email it to you because um it's a similar thing um the the theme I talk about is like I think in in America, um, or maybe the modern age, we're so obsessed with calculative thinking in the sense like we think about everything from the point of view of like, will this benefit or harm me? But I, I wonder about our ancestors. Did they always think about it this way? And I think like at least in my culture, I think like people thought a lot about duty. Like what is your duty? Um, you know, what are you obliged to do? And I guess I think that if you're an academic you should think more about duty and like your duty, I think is to, to push on these issues where you feel like you have learned something and you have something to say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, those are really interesting thoughts. I mean, part, part of academia that I think we've lost is that to some extent it's become a bit of a racket of, you know, producing outputs and saying what you need to say to get this study published. And yeah, we should be thinking and, and arguing and I'm discussing things. So yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to be proud, I think, because I think the COVID pandemic is going to end and I'm going to have published zero peer-reviewed or journal <laughs> articles about COVID. I've done a lot of stuff on COVID, but it's all podcast and uh, lay press articles and all um, very high-level stuff about the culture around how we should process evidence. And I'll be proud that I didn't uh, change my research agenda and that and then soon we'll have so many interesting cancer findings, you won't believe it, because um, we've been going full steam ahead on that. And I, but I think, I think like to me, um, I don't know, there's, there's so many science. I mean, I, I think we have this conceit that like a really good original article, it has some half-life, but it's shorter than people think. Even these New England Journal papers, like people don't remember some beautiful articles in New England Journal. And sometimes I tell like residents like, oh, you remember this article from 2005 or whatever? And they're like, what? I didn't know somebody did that. Oh, I was like, yeah, you like 10 years later, nobody knows it happened. Um, 
commentaries, I think sometimes really trenchant commentaries have a longer half-life. That's just my anecdotal impression. But I think nothing has a half-life like books. And that's why people try to write books. Um, that, you know, that Dawkins book, I mean, he wrote it, I think, when did he write it? 89 and 91, I think, Selfish Gene or no, 79. I think Selfish Gene was 79. Uh, 79 and 82. Extended Phenotype was 82, I think. I'll have to check that, fact check that afterwards. And, um, and I read it in 2002, you know, 20 years later, and it still really resonated with me. Um, and so I think, I, I, I think like that's the kind of stuff that I'm more interested in doing. Uh, yeah, these um, things live in your mind. Yeah. Before, before we were talking today, I, I looked up, um, George Orwell's essay, Notes on Nationalism. Uh -huh. Have you ever read that? No. Uh, maybe I have, but go on, go on, tell me. Yeah, it's, tell me uh, as if I have. His, his essays are, his essays are really wonderful, but Notes on Nationalism is, is kind of, a lot of this is what, you know, we've been talking about with polarization and people fixed with their views and perceiving facts based on what pre, you know, what pre-existing positions they have. Mm. And he, you know, he observed this in the forties and largely he's talking about fanatics, but you can see a lot of this in, in what's happening now. And the way he describes this stuff is so clear and, and beautiful and it really, it really stays with you. Mm. I will take a look. Dr. Bradley, it's been a real pleasure thinking through these thoughts. Um, I think you're asking great questions, and uh, I guess um, I guess I think the listeners will too. Um, and uh, you know, when you uh, want to talk about lung cancer stuff, you let us know. Come back on the podcast. Well, do thanks so much for today. It was really, really lovely talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bradley. It's a pleasure to talk to you. You've been listening to season three of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.